Revelation chapter 3 and verse number 1. If you're familiar at all with uh, the book of Revelation in the introductory chapters, the Lord has uh, shown himself to the Apostle John. The Apostle John, is uh, he has been sentenced to the Isle of Patmos. And here on the Isle of Patmos, the Lord reveals himself to John in a vision. And he brings John a message. He brings a message to the uh, different message to the seven different churches uh, around Asia Minor and at the known world at the time. And here in chapter 3, the Lord has a very specific message to the church at Sardis. Verse number 1 says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead. And look at those last few verses, few words there, and are dead. See, there's a story of a, uh, a great city, and this great city had uh, built up storehouses of wealth, and it was just known as this great city. It was actually, history tells that this city was the first city to mint gold and silver coins, uh, just a testament to their wealth. And this city was a part of the great Lydian Empire in Asia Minor and in Greece and in that area, and this was at the time of King Cyrus, and if you're familiar uh, with the Old Testament, King Cyrus let free the Jew, the Jewish nation while they were in the Babylonian captivity, and this great city here was united under Emperor Crossus, and Emperor Crossus, uh, he had become confident in what he had. He was being confident in that this great city, it, had, it was bountiful with fruits and it had all sorts of food and clothing and all filled with all sorts of luxury. And it, this city was seemed so great and he became, he became prideful. And he began to attack and get in these skirmishes with King Cyrus. And these two emperors had become to be in a, a state of war against each other. And here in this great city, they had what was called an Acropolis. And the Acropolis here, uh, these are the remains of the Acropolis in this great city. And the Acropolis is essentially this big fortress on, on top of a mountain. And the way this Acropolis was built, it was built on this mountain here, and it was such steep cliffs, and it was surrounded by this great river, which almost served as a moat. And this Acropolis here, this fortress seemed almost impregnable. It was almost indestructible. You couldn't even get into it. And this great city became confident in their security and in their wealth and all that they had. And they, they thought that it was indestructible. But little did they know. One day, one of the soldiers which was stationed there on the top of the Acropolis, he had set his helmet on the side of the railing there, on the ledge there. And the soldier here bumped over this helmet and it fell down the great side of the cliff. You can see how steep this cliff is here. And he bumps it off the side of the cliff. And him, thinking, oh, it's just fine. We're fine. We're this great city. No one's ever going to break through our Acropolis, break through our great walls, our fortress. He bumps off this helmet, and he decides to go down this secret little path down the mountain. And he makes his way down the mountain. He makes his way all the way to where the helmet was, and he comes all the way back up. But this soldier didn't know that there was a Persian soldier watching his every move. And this Persian soldier saw this indestructible fortress and saw that there was a weakness. He saw that there was a perfect way to get straight into the fortress because of what this soldier had done. And King Cyrus, he led an attack on this Acropolis there, and he had an attack around the front where they expected an attack, but he led a secret set of soldiers that flanked around the back and went up the secret alley all the way to the top and defeated this city. And this city was Sardis. And Christ knows the history of this city. And Jesus compares the same spirit of overconfidence and complacency in the history of Sardis and compares it to the same church. See, this church, they had plenty of works. They, they appeared to be alive, but it wasn't sufficient. See here, I, I was looking in a commentary, and this is quite a long quote, but it really sums up perfectly what this church was all about. The author here, he says, this church had 
gained a great reputation. It had a name. It was very honorable for a flourishing church, a name for vital, lively religion, for purity of doctrine, unity among themselves, unity and worship, decency and order. We read not of any unhappy divisions among themselves. Everything appeared well as to what falls under the observation of men. This church was not really what it was reputed to be. They had a name to live, but they were dead. There was a form of godliness, but not the power, a name to live, but not a principle of life. If there was not a total privation of life, yet there was a great deadness in their souls and in their services a great deadness in their spirits of their ministers, and a great deadness in their ministrations and in their praying, in their preaching, in their converse, and a great deadness in the people in hearing, in prayer, and in conversation. What little life was yet left among them was in a manner expiring, ready to die. See, this church had such a great reputation. Oh, if you looked at this church, they had the best sound system. They had all the nice TVs. They had all the projectors. They had they had everything. It, you would have looked at this church and said, hey, that's the church I want to go to. But Christ says, you're dead. And Sardis didn't realize. You could say that the church at Sardis was at peace. That was the peace of the dead. See, I think many a Christian today has convinced themselves of this very same lie. I know thy works, that thou livest, but you're dead. So when we look in our lives, was there a time in your life when you were closer to God then than you are now? Was there a time in your life when you were closer to God then than you are now? Was there a time when you had it? I mean had it. You had that joy of the Lord. You were so excited about worshiping in church, and you were so excited to get in studying the word of God. You had it. But look at verse 2. Verse 2, chapter 3. Those first two words, be watchful. What does that mean? The Lord says, wake up. Wake up. It's time to get it back. You lost it. You thought you had it. You looked like you had it, but you were dead. You thought you had it, but you lost it. I think of my time, uh, I'm going into my senior, he- senior year at West Coast Baptist College, and I love West Coast. It's a great Bible college, but you're constantly surrounded by the Word of God. You hear preaching five days of the week. You're studying the Word of God. You're studying every, every little book, every doctrine you have, and you're completely surrounded by it. But sometimes you can lose focus. And I, I remember this last summer, I traveled for an organization called Neighborhood Bible Time. And we traveled the country over the summer going to different churches and we preached to kids and to teenagers, and I personally got to see 50 kids saved last summer, and praise the Lord for that. But what happened? How did we get from losing sight of things at a Bible college to now it took that to that? What's the difference? See, before we left to go travel the country and preach, we had three weeks of training. And this training, we were ripped of everything no electronics no internet no nothing it was just us teaching in our bible and we were ripped of everything we could have had and we were torn down to our core we were we were humbled but guess what we got it we got it, it we may have all the things we can be surrounded by the word of god we can be in i could be in very bible college but guess what with all those great conditions guess what i still lost it You can have it all, but if you don't have it, you don't have anything. You gotta find that relationship with Christ. You gotta get that joy. So, how do we get it back? What do you do when you realize you're not as close to God as you used to be, as you once were? Tonight, I would like to take a view of three actions to take to get it back because it will change your life. The first thing you got to do, you got to remember it. Verse number two, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. Strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard 
and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come at thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. You got to remember it. See, this was a common, a common ideal in the Jewish nation. They were constantly being reminded of what God had done for them in their lives. You think of uh, the Passover. They were remembering what God did and how they put the blood over the doorpost and how the Lord, the angel of death, had passed over them. And they remember how they were delivered from the captivity in Egypt. I think of Pentecost. They were remembering the law that was given to them from Mount Sinai. God giving the Ten Commandments, and they remembered that. And then the Feast of Purim, uh, remembering God's deliverance from wicked Haman, how Queen Esther took a stand for her nation. And they remembered how God had delivered the Jewish nation. They were constantly remembering. Deuteronomy 6.12, Then beware, lest thou forget the Lord, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. God says, you got to remember. Chapter 8, verse 2, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And I like Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. You got to remember it. You got to remember what it was like before you had it. What you were before Christ. Because before we were saved, we were in darkness. We had no hope for our future. Maybe a lot of us in here, we didn't have some dark past. We didn't go down a deep way of sin. But guess what? We were still lost. We had no hope for eternity. We were looking to ourselves. How can I fulfill myself? How can I make myself happy? Because I had nothing else to give me joy. What we were before Christ. But we got to remember what Christ did for me. What did Christ do for me? This right here is a sculpture called the Bog Rider. And the Bog Rider was originally a paint, a painting. But it was a turn into the sculpture here. And a bog rider seems like a weird word, right? But if you, what is a bog rider? Well, back in the Western days, back in uh, cowboy days or whatever, every cowboy at one point had to go through and become a bog rider. That's where they started. And nobody wanted to be the bog rider. The bog rider was nasty. It was dirty. Nobody wanted to do it. Because in the plains there, when it was all dry and there was no rain, but when rain finally came, the rain would go in the low areas and would go in the marshes and create these really muddy areas called a bog. And it was filled with mud and water. The water was there, but it was super muddy. It was nasty, disgusting. But the, the cattle and the oxen, they were so thirsty. They wanted water so bad that they would go anywhere to find it. And they would go to these bogs. And they would go and they would get their water. They would quench their thirst. But they were stuck in the mud. They were stuck in that filth. They were stuck in the bog. And it was up to the bog rider to go and save them. The bog rider would go. He would look in the sky. He would look where the buzzards were surrounding, where the birds of death would be waiting for that, pe that oxen to die. He would look where all they would be surrounding. He would go on his horse, and he would go and find the oxen stuck in the bog. And he would tie his rope around the bridle of his horse. And he would go to fetch that oxen out of the dirty mire. But he couldn't lasso around his neck because if he pulled too hard, he would just kill it. It would snap its neck. So what did that bog rider do? He got off his horse, and he shoveled that thing he shoveled the oxen right out of the dirt, right out of the mud. And he would get there knee high, waist high, whatever it was, just to save the one, the one oxen. And let me tell you, Jesus is that great bog rider. He took off glory. He came down from heaven and he came to our sinful state just to save a wicked humanity from our own bog, from our own muck, from our own sin. Because when I could not go to where what he was, he came to me. He came to where I was in my filth and in my sin, and I had no hope of getting out of my bog. But Jesus came to me in my condition, and he saved me. Because there's nothing that 
that ox can, oxen can do. There's nothing that cattle can do to get out of that bog. It's stuck in there waiting and to die, essentially. It can do nothing to save itself, only for the bog rider to save them. you got to remember it. Remember what you were. Remember what Christ did. And maybe you got to remember when you actually had it. When you were in the house of the Lord, overwhelmed with the presence of God, worshiping the Lord, so excited to hear from the word of God, to hear what the Lord had for you. Remember that time when you were close to God and you look back at that time and say, man, I miss that. You got to remember it. And secondly, you got to revive it. Look, look back in verse number two again. Be watchful. And strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. You got to wake up. In order to revive it, you got to wake up. Romans 13, 11, And that knowing the time that is now, it is high time to wake up out of a sleep, for now is our salvation, which is Jesus' is coming. Jesus' is coming is nearer, nearer than we believed. Hosea 10, 12. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness on you. we got to wake up to our spiritual state. we got to wake up from our apathy. we got to wake up from our routine. we got to wake up from our bitterness, from our spiritual decay. We gotta wake up from our indifference. We gotta wake up from our pride. We gotta wake up from our self dependence. We gotta realize that, remember how it used to be, how awesome it was. But you're only gonna remember it when you wake up and realize, hey, something happened. I lost something. You gotta wake up, you gotta repent. Let me tell you from personal experience repentance, it's not, I'm sorry. Repentance is not remorse. Repentance is a forsaking. Anybody can say, oh, man, I really shouldn't have done that. I really regret that. And then what are you doing two weeks later? Same thing. Anybody can say, I'm sorry. That's why, that's why a lot of people say, what do they say? I'm sorry doesn't cut it. you got to put action behind that I'm sorry. You've got to forsake that action, forsake that sin, forsake that uh, just indifference, forsake the bitterness and apathy. We've got to repent from our sinful actions, and then we've got to revive it. What does that say? Strengthen the things which remain. We've got to look at those things, and we've got to strengthen them. We've got to strengthen our time with God, strengthen our devotions, strengthen our study, strengthen our relationships, our witness, our leadership, strengthen your passion, strengthen your influence, your reputation, strengthen your heart, strengthen your generosity, your purity, your faith, your speech, your prayer, your compassion. We've got to revive those things. What is that? The fruit of the Spirit. We're the light of the world. We're the church. If we're not the light, who's going to be? A city that's set on a hill can't be hid. we got to be the light of the world. we got to revive ourselves because if we don't stand and we don't start punching holes in the darkness, it's going to be darkness. we got to show people the hope of the bog rider that Jesus can come and save them from their sins. And we got to be, we got to be that light. We gotta wake up. We gotta repent. We gotta revive. First, you know, you gotta remember it. You gotta remember the time when you were before Christ, before Christ saved you. Remember how awful that was. And remember the life giving power that the gospel gave you when you were saved, you're on fire for the Lord. You gotta remember that. But we lost it now. What do you do when you lose it? You gotta revive it. And lastly, Look at verse, verse number three. Verse number three. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast. The ones who had it were the ones who held it. They held it tight when they got it. You know, a lot of you, you, you hold that tight. For me, it was spaghetti day at West Coast on the windy day. 
You know, when you have that plate of spaghetti and you're taking it to go and it's on a windy day, I hold that thing tight. I don't let that go. I I don't want to lose my shirt. I don't want to lose it on the pavement. I'm a costume. I need food, okay? I hold that tight. But maybe more personally, any of you parents and grandparents in here, you had your little child, your little kid. Maybe you're taking them to Six Flags or crossing the street or Disney or whatever it be. Big crowds, right? And what do you say to your little child? You say, hey, hold my hand. My dad, you say, hold my finger. I don't hold his finger. And what do you do? When you grab your kid, you hold that thing. You grasp it. You don't let go. Because you hold tightly what you value highly. You hold that. Verse 4. Look at verse 4, though. This, This is encouraging here. This seems like a doom and gloom type of message for Sardis, but guess what? Verse number four, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, in a church that could appropriately be called fraudulent, there was a remnant. There was a remnant people that still had it. They still had it. They, they remembered it. They held it tightly. They kept it. Let me tell you. It only takes a remnant to change the world. What was how many? Twelve disciples. And what did they say about them? They said, who are these which turn the world upside down? Who are these which turn the world upside down? We got more than 12 people in here, I can tell you. Queensbury, Glens Falls, Willow, wherever you are, the world needs you. They're looking for that remnant. They, they may not know that, that they need it, but we got to be that light. We got to tell them about it. But maybe, maybe you're not necessarily part of that remnant. Maybe you say, hey, listen, I'm not close as God, to God as I want to be. Well, let me tell you, it's not too late. If you believe you're not as close to God as you have before, you can change that. God wants you to. He wants, you, he wants to pull you out of the bog. He's waiting for you. He's got that lasso waiting for you. He's like, listen, he's just got to remember it. Come on, he's just got to He's got to revive it. I'm ready, I'm ready. He wants to pull you out. But may, if that's you, you're not the only one. A lot of us has been there before. Turn to Psalm 42. This is a great example here. Psalm 42. The psalmist here is experiencing the same type of regret about times past. This is written by the sons of Korah. Psalm 42, verse number 1. Many of you are familiar with this verse. We sing about it a lot. As the heart panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before my God? That's his desire. The psalmist, he's he's saying, man, that's what I want. I want to get it. I'm thirsting after you. I pant for you, O God. My tears have been my meat day and night while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? When I remember these things, there it is. What was our first thing we talked about? Remember. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me. For I had gone with the multitude. I sent with them to the house of God with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept holy day. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Let's, let's, let's go back real quick. When he says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul. He's saying, listen, I remember the times when I went up to the temple, when I was filled with joy and gladness, and I couldn't wait to get to the temple. I couldn't wait to get to the multitudes to praise the Lord. And he remembered that. He, he wanted that back. And then he says, why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted in me? The psalmist says, why am I so sad? Why am I so discouraged? Hope thou in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. He says, man, I remember that time. I remember the great times, but it's, I lost it. How do I get back to that? But he says, 
I'm going to hope in God. Because I can hope that the bog riders can still pull me out of the bog. He can pull me out again. He's there for me. I can hope in him. And when I know that I can hold on to him, I can hold on to it. And I continue to hope in Christ that he will carry me through. And he remembers those good times. And he says, I want that back. Because when you revive it, you got to hold on to it. Don't let go. You don't want to be back in the bog. Right here, this is uh, my first church at MBT. This is in Statham, Georgia. The, there's some thick accents down there, I'll tell you that. It took me a while to get used to, but here, this is uh, my first group. This is probably the smallest group I did over the summer. There's a, throughout the whole week, we had about maybe 20 to 25 kids. And praise the Lord for that. They were awesome. And let me tell you, I was terrified when I did this because I had to memorize a five-day story. I had all these things. I was supposed to get these magic tricks right. I was supposed to do all these things. And I'm, I'm in there in the nursery. I'm crying before this thing. And I was like, I'm not ready for this. But they exceeded my expectations here. And uh, this group right here, for all these adults here, I, I couldn't have done it without them. They were such big helps. And one day, after I had finished this rally in Statham, Georgia, I was on a bus driving up nine hours north to Colonial Heights, Virginia. And while I was on the bus there, it's a double-decker bus. I'm looking straight down at the highway. It was kind of weird but kind of cool. But the assistant pastor there, the associate pastor, he called me. He said, it was uh, Brother Lindell. Brother Lindell said, he's like, hey, Caleb. He's got that southern accent. You know, praise the Lord for what, what happened here this week. It wasn't a big turnout, but we saw that nine, nine souls got saved. And I was in charge of the, t uh, the kids, and my partner, the, the guy I was uh, partnered with for this summer, he was in charge of the teens. And in total, there was nine people that got saved between the teens and the kids. And praise the Lord for that. But I s he didn't tell me to this day, but one of these ladies, it might not, he, they might not even been, been in the picture. But he told me, say, hey, listen, we had an older lady in the church. And you didn't know it, but while you were preaching in the auditorium, while you were making a fool of yourself, he didn't say that, this elderly lady went door to door over every classroom in the church. And she prayed over those classrooms. She said, Lord, give me ten. Lord, give me ten. Give me ten, ten saved, ten, ten teens and kids. Just give me ten, Lord. Please, Lord, I beg you, please. And she prayed over every room. I had no clue. And Brother Lindell said, he said, uh, today, while I was on the bus, this is a Saturday, he said, today, little Millie, she's hiding back here. She's right here. She's hiding over my shoulder. He said, little Millie went home after Bible time on the Saturday, and her grandma led her to the Lord. Ten. The Lord answered her prayer. She had it. She had it. That elderly lady, she had it. And I wonder, when we go into the rest of the world today, when we're going to our job places, when we see maybe our unsafe family, when we're out and about, do they look at us and say, there's something about them. They got something. I don't know what it is, but I want it. I want it. Do they see that in us? Because she had it. Can people tell that you have it? But if you don't, you got to remember it. You got to revive it. You got to hold it. Father, we thank you for today, Lord.